Hello, everyone. This is Olga Redding with Iowa Organic Association. Um, you are joining our uh, webinar with Chris Trump on Korean natural farming. Um, what we'll do here to begin our webinar is I will get started. I'll share a quick presentation about Iowa and our mission and goals. Um, and then after that, we'll let Chris uh, share his practices and his story with all of you guys. So thank you everyone for, for being here today. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. So I'll find my PowerPoint here. All righty. So for those of you who don't know, Iowa Organic Association is a nonprofit organization that was established in 2006. And we are committed to organic education, advocacy, and community cooperation. Our mission is to advance organic agriculture and food systems in the state of Iowa. And our members represent a diverse community of Iowa's farmers, gardeners, food and farm businesses, advocates and consumers, and anyone and everyone that is interested in organic ag. And you guys are part of this community. So thank you uh, for, for being here today and for uh, your interest. As far as our priorities as an organization, we have four overarching priorities and I'll touch on them uh, briefly. Um, education, outreach, advocacy, and community. Um, so as far as education, we provide programs, expertise, and information to help expand and diversify organic opportunities and priorities in the state of Iowa. And uh, this is kind of my field. Uh, uh, this is what I'm in charge of. So um, putting together uh, lectures like the Growing Organic Expertise, which we've done last year specifically with technical service providers. Um, as well, we've received the REAP SEP grant and we have been able to expand this um, lecture series to 10 colleges across the state of Iowa. And I visited them uh, last fall and I'm in the process of scheduling uh, either lectures or possible organic field days with these colleges in the spring semester. Uh, so that's very exciting. We've also created the first and only Midwest Organic Pork Conference that was launched in 2019. Um, in 2020 was canceled, but uh, we have been collaborating with Moses and sharing some of those speakers through Moses. So we will be at Moses this year. So if you're there, please find us and come say hi. As far as outreach, we connect with target audiences and public to promote research events and resources that are beneficial to the organic community. And like I mentioned, you know, we're part of various conferences like MOSES, PFI, uh, trade shows, community events, and of course, our website represents a plethora of information that you can check out. We have uh, uh, our e-news that we send out by monthly. So if you haven't subscribed, be sure to do so. We have our calendar that has a variety of events coming up as well as of course, social media. So definitely find us out there. As far as advocacy, we advance state level leadership policies dedicated to funding and supporting Iowa's organic industry. We've met with Secretary Nag uh, last year in 2021, and we are in the process of uh, meeting with him again in 2022, a follow up conversation. Um, and then as far as community, you know, we encourage a culture of collaboration by connecting organic experts and stakeholders and resources to strengthen. I, our Iowa organic community. As far as resources, if, you, if you're not familiar with this particular resource, um, I definitely encourage you to check it out. It is available on our website via PDF form. However, I can also send it to you by mail in a paper copy. It's called our Iowa organic resource directory. And there's over 900 businesses listed in this particular directory that are nonprofits and service providers that uh, can help um, anyone interested to pursue organic agriculture. We believe it serves as a valuable tool for our organic community to achieve growth and continued success. 
And then as far as additional resources available to uh, either organic farmers or those interested to become organic are some programs through the uh, Farm Service Agency as well as uh, United States Department of Agriculture Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, so there's a few that I want to highlight here for you guys today. Uh, and what I want to also share is that all of these program links will be uh, in the description uh, of each of these winter webinars that we've been hosting this winter. Um, so you can actually click easily on those links to find out more information about these programs. But just to briefly go over, the organic certification cost share program is through the Farm Service Agency and is something that you can apply on a yearly basis and get up to $500 reimbursement for your organic expenses. Um, the non-insured crop Dis disaster assistance program is also through FSA. Um, then we also have the environmental quality incentive program short for equip through NRCS that can reimburse organic farmers and then cap 138 through NRCS that is a grant to help organic farmers with their conservation efforts on their farm. And then of course, as a nonprofit organization, we rely heavily on your support. Uh, so if you're not already a member, please consider becoming one. Um, if you have a business and would be interested to become a sponsor, we're always a welcome of those. So feel free to either reach out to Roz, our executive director or myself, we can help you with uh, for further resources as far as that's concerned. And this is all I have. For you guys and we can go ahead and let uh, and actually wa wanted to also let you guys know what we'll do is we'll allow Chris to uh, you know share his uh, story and you guys can um, you know type in your questions uh, in the chat box and I will uh, you know answer those questions after he's finalized with his uh, talk and then we can at the end of our webinar here today we can have a little Q&A session so at that time, if you want to unmute yourself and ask those questions directly of Chris, you're welcome to do so. All right, Chris, if you want to go ahead. Thanks so much, Olga, and thanks for having me here. Um, I've been in Iowa working with um, a farmer over the past year, and uh, it's such a wonderful place to uh, be participating in agriculture. So much of what um, happens in the U.S. is represented in uh, Iowa agriculture. A lot of fun, beautiful country. Yeah, and it was good to be out there and um, meet at the um, farm uh, expo and, and tour there at the Schnell Farm in Iowa. That was a blast. Um, I grew up farming. <clears throat> I'm second generation. My um, dad started uh farming on the big island of hawaii and um i grew up uh, farming there we farmed ranch cattle and um brought the first hair sheep over to hawaii and uh grew a bunch of things over the years but uh for the last 30 years we've produced macadamia nuts um so we have a 750 acre certified organic macadamia nut farm on the big island of hawaii and um my process to uh, get our, I was managing our farm as we um, converted to organic and uh, my younger brother um, who is now managing also participated as, as we uh, kind of moved into certification. But initially the, the question um, that I asked and, and what I think a lot of farmers in the US ask right now um, and the reason I'm I'm talking here about natural farming is because um, we wanted to be organic, but the cost um, to be organic didn't justify it. Um, generally speaking, we tried, um, we had a compost tea program, we had a um, composting program, all the stuff really, really well done. And uh, at the same time, the um, trees continued to yellow and uh, we, like our organic section was our lowest yielding, uh, most expensive to, to farm. So we moved into um, 
working uh, to tend to the microbial life of our soil. Um, studied in South Korea um, about 11 times over the years while we were developing this for our farm. And um, it uh, made all the difference um, as we applied to this technology to um, farming. Um, so now I teach internationally. I'm on the um, uh, research and development board for the International Macadena Society. Um, I'm working on research with this technology with several universities and um, yeah, and I speak at conferences and travel. Still involved with our farm, but my younger brothers are doing an amazing job um, running that. Um, I was just out in Iowa. Um, one of my clients is has taken his farm and is converting a thousand acres to natural farming techniques. Um, he converted most of it last year um, and is doing the rest this year um, with great success and challenges. Um, I um, have clients um, all over the world, but um, mostly in the US. Um, I work with a wine grape farmer, 750 acres in Napa Valley, and turf management uh, company in San Francisco, and um, uh, cannabis in California, and um, some hops in Michigan, all, all the different um, types of production. Um, and it's been a lot of fun to see farmers have kind of an option and a hope to farm organically without um, without having to lose the shirt. So Korean natural farming is a sovereignty for farmers movement. It's, it's, a, it's a way for a farmer to use full mechanization, all the efficiencies of big ag, while at the same time, literally using some of the best things you can as far as regenerative agriculture and, and uh, natural products, lots of which can be made on the farm at a very low cost. Um, so that's been a ton of fun um, to watch that um, kind of watch farmers wake up to that option and um, availability. And um, yeah, Olga, I could jump into some pictures. Would you like that? Sorry. Yes, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm just going to jump into the PowerPoint. Um, So if you go under where it says mute, stop video, security participants, chat and share screen with the up arrow, click on that. And then it yeah, will. I have it. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. All right. So I'll go through this somewhat quickly, but we'll touch a little on the science of uh, natural farming. Um, I am going to be coming out with a series of videos um, that include some of these farmers that have been doing this for several years now. So that's one of the projects I'm working on is a series of interviews. See, farmer stories are farmers' favorites. You know, farmers like hearing scientists talk, um, but we have this innate, deep skepticism that um, I think keeps us from losing our shirt every year. And uh, so, too much. Uh, too much outside of real experience sometimes gets lost. So um, I look forward to doing that. I do teach for free on YouTube, um, just Chris Trump on YouTube, and it's, you know, help yourself to whatever is helpful for your farm. Um, and then I teach online. So this is um, some of my farm crew there. That's um, us in Hawaii. I am uh, bald and wearing shorts. Um, these are macadamia harvesters who pick them up off the ground uh, like golf ball picker uppers. Um, and uh, so this farm um, is uh, the largest um, natural farming farm in the world. So this technology is used all over the world, uh, uh, over 70 countries and um, the um, to, to great success, uh, especially in Japan. Japan natural farming is pretty incredible and high tech. But um, yeah, I employ, I developed it for large scale. So it was a small scale technique 
and um, we developed some large scale applications. Um, <clears throat> so um, quick nod to uh, science, uh, we, um, Regenerative agriculture gets kind of um, poo pooed in some ways because so much of the bulk of research has not been in microbial diversity or um, beneficial ecology kind of conversations. Um, it's been a lot around um, other technologies. And so, um, you know, the, the science um, that we're using, um, some of it comes from. Um, traditional ag. And um, the reason that's important is because science is the definition of science is the study of nature through observation and experimentation. And the best scientists um, before our current academic system were farmers. They are in nature all the time. They're doing things, they're watching because their livelihood depends on it, their family's well being and food. Um, and so when they do things and they succeed, they carry them on to the next generation. And when they do things and they don't work out, they are uh, excluded from the training of the next generation. And so over time, traditional ag was um, very much in line with nature or in line with good science. Um, and so we've, we've circled back to some of these traditional practices and found solid science, especially touching um, microbial diversity and caring for microbes in the soil. And so I just wanted to, to nod to that as we get into this, that um, the, um, the look of agriculture being going back a couple hundred years, though that seems like, oh, we're going backwards. Um, we're actually just kind of circling back to maybe what we lost or what we gave up a little too quickly. Um, so what is green natural farming? Uh, it's all over the world, it's called natural farming, only in the US for some reason do people call it Korean natural farming. Um, it was developed in South Korea by Cho Han Yu, um, they also called Master Cho. And um, it's, he studied enzymatic theory in Japan with um, a doctor as, as well as some other um, uh, doctors he studied with there. Combining that with traditional Korean agriculture, um, that it's a elegant method for tending to the microbial life of the soil. Um, and um, this picture you see here is actually something quite special. This is um, a tool or a method for a farmer to cultivate an indigenous culture of diverse microbial life from their surrounding environment. So I was in Iowa, we went to some uh, long-standing um, uh, uh, wooded area that hadn't been in ag, was out of flight paths of, um, of planes and the, um, the um, fungi we were able to culture is, um, is diverse and kind of uninterrupted. Um, so this is a ability um, given to a farmer, a, a technique given to the farmer, giving them ability to basically, we've heard bugs in a jug, all the special things you can put on your farm that are gonna help cycle nutrients in your soil. Well, a farmer can get indigenous microbial life to establish in their ag land. And because it's not grown in the lab, you know, over, overseas or, um, you know, comes from another area, it likes this barometric pressure, this rainfall, this temperature, this soil type, and it self-perpetuates, it gets established. And as long as we're not destroying it, um, just through our farming practices, this will self-perpetuate. So a farmer can take this material, um, culture it, um, we mix it with brown sugar, which has an osmotic pressure, kind of like salt fish for a long sea voyage. Um, which causes the um, beneficial fungi to sporulate, as well as other things to cyst and go dormant, so that a farmer can have a shelf-stable inoculum on their shelf, ready to use when the need is to apply. Um, for example, um, Kyle Schnell is applying with a giant cedar um, his seeds and, and dosing um, right around the seed uh, dose of 
indigenous um, microbial inoculum via a compost tea um, right at the seed place. And then that spring, as the sprouts came up, so did a mat of mycelial web on the this, which just the year before had been conventional ag. Now there's life blooming. Um, at every seed point. So it's a, it's a tool for a farmer to culture their own diverse microbial life, which diversity in life is how nature works as far as soil goes. That's where the protection comes from. So we grow it out on um, a uh, substrate. So we get that little bit of inoculum to grow out further. And um, you have an indigenous microorganism amazingly accessible and uh, very doable for um, your average farm. There is learning curve, it is a technique, so it's not uh, just buy a bottle, but very doable and also a huge cost savings potentially for farmers. Um, this is an example of a um, uh, analysis, this is from our farm, um, analysis of that material we were just looking at. And um, so if you, We'll jump to the, so here's your total fungi in this material. Um, you have total um, bacteria is just down from total fungi. And then you have total fungal to bacterial ratio. And so most ag land has bacteria and um, is bacterially imbalanced. Most of our crops, like at least, I mean, you're, you're, Crops that like the least amount of fungi, like about a one-to-one -one fungal to bacterial ratio, which is like leafy greens and lettuce. But as you move towards shrubs, so um, soy or corn, these things like much more fungal um, content in their soil. Fungal. Um, Olga, your mic is um, loud. Um, so, Fungal to bacterial ratio is an extremely important aspect of soil health. And it's something that's very little looked at in um, uh, current um, studies and analysis as well. Hey, Olga, is that your? Oh, oh that's not... somebody's, uh, that's somebody okay. else that joined in. I'm going to try to mute them here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry. In my ear, it's, it's hard. Um, sorry about that. No. Um, and so this is what allows um, plants root zone to create um, symbiotic relationships and um, get, um, as plants photosynthesize, they push excess carbohydrates into the root zone, um, opening a kind of a leach field or a, a um, exudate field where they um, invite relationships with um, um, beneficial microbes. They create symbiotic relationships. So that invitation of um, the, that the plant makes with carbohydrates, here's cake, um, you know, I, I'm trading for minor minerals. And so that fungi can be processing the sand, silt, and clay into uh, available nutrients for your plants um, in real time um, that pays you. And um, this fungal to bacterial ratio, however, um, most of the um, things that are traditional uh, um, traditional organic, you know, that we're putting on are highly bacterial um, products. We're not getting any fungi. And so that's why my trees, trees like a thousand to one, a hundred to a thousand to one fungal bacterial ratio, more fungi. And uh, so as we did traditional organic, we weren't getting any fungi and that bacterial imbalance caused our trees to be malnourished. This is a very important item that's not talked about at all in ag land. And so just by having, establishing some diverse fungal life, you can have better nutrient uptake, even if you combined it with conventional ag. I'm not, you know, encouraging that, but I'm also, you know, um, saying that is a possibility for some of these farmers that want to transition and see if there's viability to some of these techniques. Use what you have and do a, a low cost or a, a, you know, lower scale, smaller scale trial and watch, you know, watch that, that nutrient uptake change where you're getting paid a lot more for the um, fertilizer you put down as far as yield. Oops. Um, 
so more more of these um, charts um, talked a little bit about this. The um, the uh, oh, this is sorry that's going to be loud. We'll just skip this. That's making the uh, making the compost on our farm, um, and um, the uh, this is microscopic fungi under a microscope, and uh, the wonderful produce it produces. That's uh, kids enjoying the produce in Hawaii. Um, this is a study done by Dr. Kun Hui Wang um, on the Big Island of Hawaii using natural farming. Just a little. Um, quick journey through a peer review study, if you will. Um, the question that was asked is, um, you know, what um, is more viable for a farmer? What's, what's affecting the bottom line? <clears throat> How do these um, products compare uh, against each other? So these are some products that are on the market and available in Hawaii. This study was paid for by EM they um, had to let it be published initially, but then they owned it. So they took it down because they didn't like the results. Um, but they, um, the treatments were a standard grower practice, which is a full, um, full fertilizer, conventional fertilizer with weekly micronutrients, no treatment, IMO, um, plus a foliar nutrient spray. Um, IMO is that basically compost concentrate full of microbial life. Um, and then with an addition of some foliar nutrients that you can make, EM is uh, EM fertilizer plus, or EM inoculum plus a 50% of a conventional fertilizer application. So this is big, you know, 30, 30, 30 type fertilizer. Um, Sumagro is standard fertilizer. Um, and then, um, Mycos, you know, 50% application um, with some, with some in, uh, bugs in a jug kind of inoculum um, and then 25% fertilizer. So big fertilizers plus some bugs in a jug and then just um, conventional ag um, and then EM with some big fertilizers against IMO. So here's your corn height. Um, five weeks after planting standard grower practice. And then just kind of cruise through this, but um, you have some varying results and, you know, everything's kind of um, similar, um, good soil. Um, the um, total fruit weight, which is um, from corn is um, IMOs way out ahead. Um, total plant biomass, um, as we know, you can produce a lot of leaves and foliage with, um, you know, a lot of fertilizer. And so everything's kind of up there and pretty similar. Um, and so conclusions, fruit weight with IMO, um, natural farming practices and EM produce comparable yields as the standard grower practices. Um, it's interesting to note on that first conclusion that you're applying um, a pretty high cost um, bugs in a jug with a, um, a full fertilizer uh, or 50% fertilizer. So you're spending that money um, compared. So bottom line, if you're getting equal um, is better with IMO. Um, IMO received no conventional fertilizer applications, but a weekly application of foliar nutrients, which is pretty homeopathic. Um, and um, chlorophyll, yeah, it was good, good trial. Uh, Kun Hui Wang is a great researcher. She's done a bunch of other um, projects in Hawaii recently. Um, so you have, um, natural farming and conventional practices um, achieving similar results. Um, and um, in the end, however, it was noteworthy that microorganism, microorganism treatments did comparably well with only one to two applications up front versus the standard practice, which was throughout. Um, 
So that was, it's just an inoculum they put down initially and then didn't fertilize where the others got a kind of maintained uh, a good amount. Um, this is what we found on our farm. Um, uh, this is another research project I did um, with MIT. Um, but this is another, um, this is what we found on our farm is that we could produce a very similar yield. Um, and it, our costs to produce, um, we decreased our cost of fertilizer, but increased our costs of man hours because we now could not herbicide and we mowed. So that switch from conventional, there was a loss in that we had these efficiencies with herbicide, um, but there was a gain in that we weren't spending this huge bill on fertilizer. Um, Kyle Schnell, I think he had a $100,000 um, fertilizer bill change, went from 130 for the year to uh, 30,000. But um, it's also interesting to note that we did not think the corn would do as well. And so I think he had a lower yield um, this first year on corn than he had the previous year. But that's because corn needs that real nutrient cycling. And there's a kind of a startup time for microbes to be cycling nutrients at the level that conventional fertilizer can really produce. And um, so we've talked about that and, and it may not be the best crop to run in year one of transition. Um, that's kind of the conclusion. Whereas soy, alfalfa and rye did amazing. Um, this we did a um, trial of um, DNA. Um, there was a, the, the doctor had a, um, wasn't able to complete it, left MIT. And so we had this half finished project. It was really great. We're now redoing the project with New York University, um, assessing the microbial um, diversity through DNA mapping uh, of what we're achieving with IMO. Um, I think one of the things that um, touches me with ag and uh, what we're doing here is that we um, we have a lot of young people that have zero interest in being a part of the farm. And there's a few reasons to that. One is um, dad's not making money or mom's not making money on the farm. Uh, which is a huge reason that's a lack of sustainability. Um, two, that there's a, um, as we get into, um, I'm not a, I'm not anti any um, farming practices as much as I'm pro uh, a solution for farmers. I think farmers are very uh, conscientious people that um, care to do their very best um, on average or for the most part. And um, many of them are faced with tough decisions pretty much every year. Um, and so the um, job is not to say boo on some current agricultural practice, but to find a solution that's both profitable and regenerative so that farmers can make a shift or at least have the option. Um, natural farming is that or was that for a farm and has been that for a lot of people I've been working with. And, um, and what I see potentially as another part of natural farming um, being uh, a more adopted practice is that the connection to land um, and being something that is um, really um, important for farmers to want to farm that there's a connection to our whole food system and that instead of interacting with poison. Um, they're interacting with um, life-giving things. All our fertilizer we produce for natural farming you can eat. Um, the hawks come while I spray it out on my farm. Um, the hawks come and let me blast them with my big, uh, you know, Ventur uh, Venturi air sprayer. Um, and um, it's, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's connective. And so I think that's uh, a part of it. Um, so you can um, you can check it out on YouTube. It's it's free and, and easy to access. Um, I teach small scale on YouTube, large scale. Generally, I'm working with clients or farms um, 
and uh, yeah, and then also there's online class at my website, but the um, the um, the journey to world takeover I think is um, the part that uh, that I'm excited about, and that we can look at a new way of farming. Uh, an old way of farming, but a, a way that um, where we're combining great chemical technology um, and biological understanding that it's pretty cutting edge right now. We don't know a whole lot of what goes on in the microbiological world. I think all of academia understands about 0.03% of what goes on in the microbiological world, which is a whole lot less than we understand about the ocean or outer space. and. Uh, Maybe, you know, it's, it's something that um, is growing and uh, is quite exciting. Um, yeah, I... Um, there, there's a question that popped in the chat. Sure. So Margaret is asking, how were the desired ranges, levels of bacteria, fungi, etc., and the ratios determined for the lab report from Earth Fork LLC? Yeah, so um, that is a standard um, biological analysis. Um, Earthboard is one of many labs that uh, perform that. Um, would it be helpful if I brought that back up, you think? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Earthboard is one of many that perform that. Um, and um, And uh, the you can um, you can order these is about a hundred dollar test. Um, you can order it from Earthport. You can order it from um, any lab that does diverse um, analysis. Um, with Earthport, this is a basic biology. You actually know, um, yeah. There's no nematodes in here, so you can also have a nematode analysis. But um, this is counting. So what they do is they'll put a drop of water and then random, there's a random um, biomass counting. So they'll count total bacteria, total fungi in a um, kind of non-selective or, um, it's very tedious, um, non-selective way where they'll move through the slide and they'll do multiple slides of the same material and they'll count a total um, bacteria biomass and fungal biomass. That's a very um, specific way that this is done and it's um, a, a standard practice all over the world. So it's adopted by microbiologists pretty much everywhere. Um, and yeah, it's, um, so the, um, I, wish I don't have a laser pointer. Do you I? can hover your mouse or mouse on uh, whatever you're trying to show. I can't see my mouse for some reason, so oh, yeah. that's not helping. But um, yeah, so um, um, anyways, there's any, a, any more question on that? We can, yeah, we can there's get into a, couple, it. a couple more questions. Um, we have kudos, Chris, and way to go. Um, this, has your scientific team looked at how these different soil microbial compositions affect the human gut? microbial uh, upon foods consumption? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're all pretty into probiotics these days. We know that, um, so one of the first talks I gave was, um, our, our first um, talks I made this analogy was in China. I was speaking at the international um, an academia nut convention and um, room full of scientists and I used uh, fecal matter transplant which I could actually pull this up um, to explain it um, but it's a um, we know that if humans don't have diverse gut biomes um, that we die pretty much this is not something we can um, sustain if we don't have gut biology um, here we go. Let's have, let's, let's share this just for fun. I think it'll be interesting. Um, so I, 
finished the talk um, in China. And the man that developed fecal matter transplant, this um, <clears throat> technique used all over the world for humans, came up and was super excited that I made the analogy for plants. But what we're doing is um, you have a trillion microbes in your body. You're outnumbered about, actually, no, it's, that's, that's inaccurate. You, it, you're outnumbered about a trillion to one in your body. It's, it's more like a billion. Um, they contribute to you getting nutrients from your food. If you don't have microbes in your gut, you do not get nutrients from your food. And there's a term for that. It's a wasting disease where people eat good food, but they become malnourished and die. And so what they developed um, is, uh, so you see the um, correlation we're making here. Um, there it is, um, between the plant roots and the human gut. And it, they're very similar, except ours is a tube and theirs is a rod um, with the kind of food and microbes on the outside of the rod, whereas ours is, a tube with the food and microbes on the inside. Um, we decline without um, gut diversity, so do um, plants. And so uh, in humans, uh, fecal matter transplant was developed or fecal um, bi microbiota transplant. And um, we understand so little about this technique. We don't actually, isolate or know what microbes we're taking from one human and sticking in the other one because it's too complex. We're taking a huge swath of diversity. But the point is we don't care, it works. The diversity is what's the protection for humans. Um, and so it's the same thing we're doing with plants. We are, um, we are, um, taking a diverse, healthy ecosystem, an environment in nature, and, um, and taking a snapshot of nature's diversity, something that's found balance and self-perpetuated for a thousand years, and we're moving it onto our ag land that's the same temperature, rainfall, general soil structure, and the, it gets established. Now we have nutrient cycling and our plants are no longer malnourished, even though we're feeding them. And so the, um, yeah, that, that uh, those microbes are really important and humans have become more and more in need of supplementing our, our human biota or our, our gut biome because everything we eat is bleach washed or, you know, whereas if you go out in nature and you eat um, a fruit or a leaf or something from nature, it's covered in fungi, yeast and bacteria that are the very things needed to digest it. And so, yeah, it's, it's good for humans um, to have living systems, absolutely. Troy has a question. He says, so are you gathering the soil bacteria and fungi just from the Korean forest or can I gather it from the soils of my forests and grassland? It's all about indigenous. So wherever you are is the area. So you wanna go a little higher in elevation. Generally, there's a hardier, um, kind of population rather than lower in population. But if you're in Iowa, there's no real options there. So just uh, gather it where you can. Um, but yeah, it's um, what you want to do is the, the most untouched. So if you can find a place that hasn't been messed with for a thousand years, that's ideal. A place that's always been getting sprayed by flyovers is not going to have the diversity we're looking for. And it's not going to get you what you need. Okay, Steve is asking, what is a good TF-TB ratio for a garden? Um, you know, shooting for one-to-one -one is, is a great goal initially because all your lettuce is gonna go great. Um, some of your brassicas actually are the one exception. They do like a little bacterial imbalance, um, but you can just um, put a little, you know, fresh or, or raw, compost on there or, or some food scraps or something to get that bacterial imbalance. But generally a one-to-one, -one, um, if you can get like a 10-to-one or a two-to-one or just a little bit more fungal, that's going to have all your peppers and all your other things growing really well. So anywhere from a one-to-one to a 10-to-one. -one. Good okay. question. 
Gotcha. Carolyn is asking, is the tea mix approved by you? U.S. organic certification. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, uh, we're fully certified with this practice, um, and other farmers have done the same. Perfect. Troy has a follow-up question: Is there a difference in the forest microbes and the grassland microbes, and what crops they promote? Um, yes and no. Um, so, for your purposes as a farmer, you want both because nature will find balance. Also, the exodus of your crop will help to establish a uh, custom mix, if you will, of what's thriving and cycling on those root exodus that are happening in that particular crop. So you want diversity. So whatever's needed to be there will rise up and be there, especially spring, summer, fall, you have fluctuations on population. Spring, a type of microbes is higher as things get hot. Uh, populations change. And so you want all of it. Diversity, if I could say that word um, 50 times and it wouldn't be awkward right now, I just start repeating diversity as the goal here. But um, you get the idea. Gotcha. Drew Erickson said that Zach Wright of Living Soil Compost Lab is local to the Midwest and can help with testing for any of you guys that are interested. Uh, Branda had an, a question. So if planes routinely pass over our place, that would not work? It's the spray. Um, if, if you're getting... Um, over time, we have found that conventional practices knock out diversity. And that doesn't mean everything dies, but um, um, the at-risk things tend to die. And the first things to go generally are um, big beneficial fungi. Um, they're just a little bit more susceptible to those kind of environmental factors, um, especially um, herbicide. Herbicide glyphosate has a, a way of deoxygenating or or um, inhibiting oxygen uptake in soil. And that deoxygenation and that, especially in that top few inches where all these aerobic um, microbes live um, causes a die off. And so, yeah, it's just, um, it doesn't mean that you don't have life there. It's just, if you're going to search for an inoculum, something to bring life onto your farm, try and go to a place that is um, somewhat untouched or as much as possible. Okay. Troy has a question regarding FMT. If my cows spread their own manure over their pastures through rotational grazing and hay feeding in the winter, will that accomplish the same goal? And if I eat the meat milk from those animals, will I get those good bugs? So no, that does not accomplish the same goal. Um, valid question. Yeah, they're pooping. and But if your whole diversity in their system and their gut and their land is limited, then they've never had access to diverse microbial communities to get that established in their butt, in their gut. So their, their feces is, is not diverse. They're still cycling nutrients. Uh, cows are great holders of lactic acid bacteria um, or lactobacilli family microbes. But if you want real diversity, you need to introduce it to their pasture land. One of my students is a dairyman in Ireland, and he's been written up in several Irish magazines. He um, has been being approached by the news and the Irish organics um, because he has green grass and cows that don't need vets. Um, when other people don't have grass and um, he was able to do away with his hay um, purchasing in the winter because he's able to feed um, throughout um, when they didn't used to be able to. So he's doing very well. Um, I plan to go over there um, and teach a class um, this June, um, but it was the introduction of diverse microbes that caused um, his cows, instead of going out and eating for eight hours a day, and then coming back and needing supplement to go out and they eat for three or four hours and they sit down and chew their cud because they become satiated. Uh, his milk fats went up, his production went up and it was just better grass. Awesome, very cool. Uh, Fred says, I have heard about the Johnson SU, Sue. Johnson Sue. Yeah. yeah, Johnson Sue compost bioreactor, which greatly 
improves the fungal community. Does this practice fit in with the Korean natural farming? Absolutely. Johnson Sioux is a uh, simple worm bin, uh, a big old worm bin. And um, yeah, so my client, um, Kyle Schnell, in uh, there in Iowa is um, using Johnson Sioux um, in combination with Korean natural farming. And so what we do is we're constantly inoculating his Johnson Sioux with his leftovers from his tea brew and um, it's improving his Johnson Sioux and we're able to use Johnson Sioux leachate, which is a verma um, humic and fulvic um, acid, which is part of the compost tea brew or the liquid IMO brew that um, he's applying. So that, that leachate, the drippings from the breakdown of the material that the worms are produced, you can buy humic acid, but what worms produce is the highest quality humic acid you can get. So it's better to make it yourself than buy humic acid. And then that material also is great because it's not a high heat compost. It's great at maintaining a diverse microbial population. So yeah, I'm a big fan of Johnson Soup. Very it's cool. part of it. Very cool. Leanna is actually, it says, to piggyback on the Johnson Sioux question, could you inoculate a Johnson Sioux bioreactor and use that as a way to amplify IMO populations? So you're not going to amplify, but it is a place to store and maintain, and you're going to get better cycling in your Johnson Sioux um, from that inoculation. So absolutely, you can inoculate it. Um, it doesn't this is the same thing with the question of if my cows are pooping and they're rotating through, um, you only have what you have. So if there's, you know, um, 60, uh, where if we all represent a family, you know, there's 60, I don't know how many of us there is in the room. Um, if we all represent a family and, and we're, you know, we're having third and fourth generations, you know, um, we're not going to have, um, and you, you take half of us and put us in one state and another half and put us in another state and don't let us move states. Um, we're only going to have that half growing over generations, even though you're growing really well, you're not going to get the other half of the, um, you know, um, genetic diversity um, from the people in the other state. You, it doesn't, doesn't just show up that all of a sudden you get another race or you know ethnicity pop in out of nowhere. It has to be brought in. And so that's how microbes work. You can inoculate your John, your Johnson Sioux can have a population of microbes, but it's only growing that population of microbes and they're dying. And generally the only way that goes is slow decline in diversity, potential decline. Same thing on your land. Cows, hooves are really hard in that top two inches of soil, especially when it's wet. So you have decline in aerobic diversity over time and, um, and you're not getting anything from nowhere. Um, the only way fungi show up, though bacteria will float in on the wind, fungi show up by a bird dropping feces or uh, deer eating some mushrooms in the forest and coming and pooping in your land. There's no other, there's no other transport method. So us bringing it in broad spraying and inoculum allows the introduction of diversity. Uh, this question kind of fits into what you just said. Uh, so if I let my cows go into the forest from time to time, will that inoculate their rumens? It won't hurt if your forest is diverse. Yeah, they're they're eating some of those wild that wild forage. Uh, they're foraging and eating some of that other types of plants and grasses that um, maybe aren't as impacted by continual grazing. Very possible that you could be bringing in diversity from that practice. Yeah. Rotational grazing is a wonderful practice. Very cool. Troy has another question. So when I make my compost, um, I should get a few scopes of forest soil to mix in, right? In a compost bin that is 10 by 10 by six, how much forest soil to inoculate? That is a, a great takeaway, uh, Troy, from this conversation. And it is the simplest thing you can do um, to put this into practice right away is to grab some, some of that nice. And what you're looking for is that white spider webby material that's under um, a stick or some leaves when you walk into the forest and kick it over in that visible strand 
that where you can see that individual spider web strand with your naked eye, that tells us that it's over four micrometers because we can see it with our naked eye. The human eye can only perceive an individual strand that's four micrometers or larger. Um, everything else smaller looks like fuzz or scale or something like that. And all disease causing fungi are about 1.5 micrometers or smaller. And so by identifying a big, large strand or just a individual strand like a spider web when you go into the forest, you're selecting very scientifically for beneficial fungi. And um, so yeah, grab some of that. You really only need a handful for a 10 by 10 like you're describing. It's very little to inoculate. Um, but the IMO process, IMO1, um, is great because we're not constantly taking material out of the forest. We're putting a rice collection box. It's getting inoculated and we're moving that box, really never removing anything from the forest other than inviting the collection. So if everybody took over, if natural farming took over and everybody did it, um, there wouldn't be a raping of the forest for, you know, leaf litter. Um, and so that's long-term kind of thought, but yes, initially grab some leaf litter from your local forest, put it in your compost and, uh, take good care of that spot you collected it from so you can go back there. Um, are you using mealworms in this scenario? Not at all. Okay. On sourcing IMO, you mentioned higher altitude locations will give better quality organisms, but what about natural food plains, wetlands? High altitude is hard to come by in the Midwest. Yeah, no, I, I was teasing you guys about that. It's pretty... Uh, no, don't worry about higher altitude. The point is in the general climate similarity is good. Wetlands are great, grasslands, plains. Um, the thing is, is um, do not be surprised in how depleted so much of the territory is um, microbially diversity wise. Um, it's staggering. Even I had a, um, a scientist, soil scientist grab some, um, soil from a pretty famous plains, a plains that had been left alone for a while or so we thought, and we scoped it for diversity and there was nothing there. It was just bacteria, there was no remaining fungi. And um, so yeah, as best as you can do with untouched or um, pristine spaces, the, the better. Um, sorry, there's more to an that answer, but that's I think what we got time for. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, uh, Troy says we still have virgin prairie soils in the lowest hills of Western Iowa. Sweet. So, yeah, so here's a pro tip there for you guys. All right. Well, Chris, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing your knowledge uh, with all of us. Um, for everyone, you guys, I will be sending uh, an email with a quick survey. It'll take you five minutes or so. Those surveys are used for grant reporting purposes and they help us understand how to best serve you in the future, as well as a link to this recording on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to rewatch or share with someone that may benefit from this information, please do so. Uh, in the meantime, Chris, thank you again for uh, your expertise. And thank you, everybody, for joining. There's a couple more comments. Brenda says, fantastic. So informational and necessary as we continue with increasing plant life. So awesome. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks for having me, Olga. Of course. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.